I think as of today, 50 or 60% of the average American's calories are coming from this group of foods that we describe as ultra processed. And over recent years, researchers like Kevin Hall and others have performed these controlled feeding trials that have shown that ultra processed diets lead to overeating and weight gain compared to minimally processed diets, even when meals are, are designed to be similar in kind of macronutrient content and sugar and sodium and fiber, all these things. And then just recently, the American Heart Association issued a scientific advisory sort of highlighting the cardiometabolic risks of ultra processed foods and calling for policy changes, policy action. And I know that you wrote a blog on this. You sent it to me yesterday. From your perspective, what are the most important takeaways about this group of foods, ultra-processed foods, for people to understand? So, Simon, ultra-processed foods to begin with are what we used to call junk food. And, and we've switched the nomenclature, largely courtesy of the work of Professor Carlos Montero and colleagues at the University of Sao Paulo in Brazil, who gave us the NOVA classification. So we now have an operational definition of what used to be junk food. So it used to be junk food was, you know, vaguely defined, but you kind of knew it when you saw it. And mostly you looked away because you wanted to eat it and didn't want to have to confront the fact that it was junk where food ought to be. We now have ultra processed food. And there are four stages of, of processing in the NOVA classification, beginning with wholly unprocessed foods and ending with foods that use ingredients that a home cook would not have in the kitchen. And the main thing we need to be aware of is that there is a massive overlap between long ingredient lists and ultra processing and the commercial manufacture of foods and excesses of added salt, added sugar, added flavorants that stimulate the appetite center, and all the wrong kinds of fat. So leaving aside the issue of how much a food is processed and leaving aside for the moment the issue of how much direct damage is being done by texturizers and emulsifiers and, and preservatives, food chemicals that aren't a major part of the recipe that are, but that are serving some functional role, there is a tremendous amount of overlap between the fundamental liabilities of the modern diet, too much added sugar, too much salt, too much saturated fat, too much of the wrong kinds of unsaturated fat or, or just imbalances there, and ultra-processed food. They, they, those things go together. These are things that come in bags, boxes, bottles, jars, and cans with very long ingredient lists. And, and then there's another critical consideration. So first, what we ought to be looking out for is highly processed food that's giving us way too much of what we get too much of, and by the way, way too little of what we get too little of, like, for example, fiber. To me, the real story about ultra-processed food is the intention. And you know, food processing originally had as its intention food safety extending shelf life, keeping things from spoiling, making it possible to eat food in winter that we grew in the summer and that kind of thing. But it just, like everything else, it, it evolved and then ultimately devolved so that it took on a whole host of other objectives. They've been described a number of times in high-profile places like the Chicago Tribune and the New York Times. The best place you can look is the work of Michael Moss, a Pulitzer Prize-winning investigative journalist, author of two books, Salt, Sugar, Fat, and Hooked, all about the machinations of the food industry. There was an excerpt from the first of those two books, Salt, Sugar, Fat, that was used as a New York Times Magazine cover story in, I think it was 2013. It goes back a ways now. The title was The Extraordinary Science of Addictive Junk Food. Let that sink in for a, sec a second. The extraordinary science of addictive junk food. And in that story, and, and you, you can read this for yourself, just Google Moss Addictive and you'll pull this right up. Michael tells the story of how every major multinational food company hires a team of scientists with the best credentials that money can buy, gives them the best tech that money can buy, like functional MRI machines, and marching orders to devise and design food people can't stop eating 
until their arms get tired from lifting it to their mouths. We, we all, I suppose, remember the Lay's potato chip ads from back in the day, bet you can't eat just one. Well, that was a threat and one they were prepared to laugh about all the way to the bank. And it wasn't just Lay's potato chips. It was everything in the ultra processed food supply. So, so for me, the, the critical thing we should be looking at with ultra processed food is what is it for from the production side of the equation? And what it's for is to propagate overeating. It's food you cannot stop eating. So you eat more of it. So you finish it faster. So you replace it sooner. So you spend more money, which is bad for you because you're basically spending your money to get fat and sick, but it's good for the person selling the stuff. That's the story. So for the most part, it's easy to identify this junk food. It's, you know, it doesn't look like anything direct from nature. It's, it comes in colors that are not part of the natural world. It's got these ingredient lists that run off the page. And it's got these highly potent flavors because it's got added salt and added sugar and it's got artificial flavorants and so forth. And there's an awful lot in the food supply that's that. It's frankenfood. It's, it's junk where food ought to be. Pretty easily identifiable if you're being you know, brutally honest with yourself. And the problem there is both that it is a delivery vehicle for all sorts of stuff that's harmful to you, the excess salt, the excess sugar, the wrong kinds of fat. But it's specifically designed to make you overeat. It's designed to put the human appetite center into overdrive. And it's designed to do that because the foods are engineered to achieve something called a bliss point, which essentially maximizes the quantity of eating we do before we feel full. I'd like to digress for just a second and point something out to people. If you've ever overeaten at a big family celebration, a major holiday, for example, Christmas, Easter, Thanksgiving, whatever it may be, you know the scenario where you eat and eat and eat and it's it's all wonderful until you really feel like you couldn't eat another bite. And you lay down your fork and you moan and you groan and say, oh God, I, I overate, I couldn't eat another bite. And then either you or somebody near you at the table says, that's true, what's for dessert? And not too long after, you are eating dessert. You couldn't eat another bite, but what's for dessert? We've all experienced that. And there are usually jokes to go along with that about an extra stomach or a hollow leg. You know, we, we do anatomy in medical school and we didn't find those. The answer is something called sensory specific satiety. So the, the appetite center in the ventral medial hypothalamus of the human brain is wired in a sensory specific manner, meaning that if you eat salty food, at some point you don't want any more salty food, but you may still want sweet or sour or savory. If you eat enough savory food, you still only want sweet. If you eat enough sweet food, you may want salty. And if you can engineer all of those flavors into all foods all the time, they put the appetite center into overdrive. You've essentially, you've created variety within an individual food. Ultra processed food is a buffet in a box, essentially. And it's one of the mechanisms by which it stimulates overconsumption. So what you look out for is anything that doesn't look like real food, anything where the ingredients are unrecognizable, anything where you'd be really hard pressed to say what part of the natural world, <laughs> what tree did this grow on? What, what soil did this come from? What kind of ambulation did this animal have? I mean, if you can't tell where it came from, it's probably ultra processed. But the real liability is the fact that the majority of ultra processed foods are designed to foster overconsumption and all the ills that result from that. And that's because that's highly profitable and it makes perfect sense. So these, these multinational food companies are really exploiting our biology, uh, biology that, that we've been handed through evolution that once would have served humans very well in periods of famine. Exactly right. I mean, everything about our adaptations works well in a natural world. It, it just can be turned against us in a world that is as contrived as ours. If you're in the grocery store and you're trying to navigate this space, how do you distinguish between ultra-processed foods that may actually be health promoting versus those that are not health promoting. And I asked this question because I saw that the AHA 
scientific advisory paper sort of specifically called out certain foods like whole grain bread or low sugar yogurt or even nut butters that could be considered processed or, or ultra processed. What would the difference be between a food that's ultra processed and, and might be one that you want to steer clear of versus one that could be health promoting? I have a different example in mind than there. So in general, I line up very well with the AHA paper. They basically talk about the fact that for the most part, ultra processed food and bad food overlap. And in the the blog post I shared with you, Simon, and feel free to post that for the audience, I drew a Venn diagram, which basically was ultra processed food and bad food or junk food. And they massively overlap but they don't overlap perfectly, meaning there can be some ultra-processed food that isn't bad and some bad food that isn't ultra-processed. And I think that's the reality. And the AHA paper does a very nice job of parsing that nuance, and then they, they use these various examples. They point out, as I just did, that overwhelmingly food that's ultra-processed is also a delivery vehicle for all sorts of stuff that's bad for you, excess salt, excess sugar, wrong kinds of fat, and so forth. So for the most part, it's an easy call. This food would have been bad for you even if it wasn't ultra-processed, and it's ultra-processed. So, you know, it's just, it's easy. I would use a different example, though, to point out that it all comes down to intention. So, you know, again, with a lot of ultra-processed food, now the intention is, as Michael Moss describes, it's designed to be as addictive as possible. It's designed for the bliss point. It's designed to make you overeat. And your obesity and type 2 diabetes be damned because you know, I don't care. I'm, I'm going to profit off of your gullibility. You're going to buy it. You're going to eat it. I'm going to get rich. So too bad for you. I mean, that's, that's the food industry perspective as far as I can tell. But sometimes food is put together to service a completely different objective. And we have to think about what the intention was and what space in the overall food supply and in our diets that food occupies. And the best example from my point of view is plant-based meats. So I, I'm i mostly vegan. I unashamedly acknowledge that I eat mostly plants. And, and whenever possible, you know, when, when I've got control over my diet, I'm not traveling and so forth, I eat only plants and happily so. So I'm not interested in, you know, plant-based meats that bleed. I, I you know, I, I gave up beef as a teenager. I haven't eaten mammals since then. I haven't eaten poultry in a very long time. And I, I don't I don't want my burger to bleed. My wife makes these fantastic vegan burgers. They're absolutely delicious. They don't bleed. I'm perfectly happy with them. You know, I don't need alternatives to beans and lentils because I actually love those. That's me, okay? I'm, I'm not saying that needs to be you. I'm just saying that's me. So so impossible and beyond. Those things were not, they were never for me. I never wanted them. I never needed them. Who are they for? Well, they're for my patients who've eaten meat their whole lives, who love the taste of it, who are familiar with the taste of it, who don't really know how to live any other way, but who say, yes, doc, I'd like to be healthier. And yes, doc, I don't want to be responsible for cruelty. And yes, doc, I, I don't want to be the, the reason the Amazon rainforest gets burned down. But I, this is how I like to eat. Can I have my beef and not eat it too? And the answer is yes, with beyond and impossible and ultimately other alternative cell cultured meat and so forth. So the the sadly from my point so I, I i very early on started weighing in about these products and said these are great these are these are these are not directed to vegans and vegetarians they're directed to carnivores who have a carnivorous palate who are, who are never going to give up beef altogether unless they can eat an alternative that satisfies but if they can first of all you've immediately cut out the cruelty and you've immediately reduced the environmental impact and maybe it's a gateway food too Maybe the fact that it's made out of plants will have these people interested in trying more plants and will shift diet in a favorable direction. It's all good. My community of nutrition experts immediately started weighing in about how processed these products were. And then, you know, we got preoccupied with the work of Carlos and, and colleagues in the NOVA classification, and these foods qualified as ultra-processed. 
And I think we threw out the baby with the bathwater and the whole plant-based meat industry tanked. I mean, a- after very high valuations for Beyond and Impossible, their sales plummeted. And, and I think that all had to do with being tarnished with the label of ultra-processed. And I think that was a terrible mistake. These were not foods that were designed to be addictive. These were not foods that were processed more than they needed to be to make you overeat. This was an effort to say, can we satisfy the palates of carnivores in a way that's massively less harmful to our fellow creatures and the planet? And then that leaves unanswered a third question. You know, what about the direct human health effects? Are they better for you than the hamburger you'd be eating instead? So early on, I I wrote a piece, I think, on Medium, where somewhat ironically, it turned out that the final word on the topic of plant-based meats was courtesy of a guy named Meatloaf two out of three ain't bad. I said, look, if we if we take those three windows I talked about earlier, right, we should look at food through, you know, what are the direct human health effects? How are we treating our fellow creatures? And what are the planetary health effects? Well, we don't yet know the direct human health effects of these plant-based meats, but we know there's no cruelty to, to animals involved and it's much better for the planet. And we do know those two things, by the way. And we know them even more now than when I wrote this piece. And I said, that's good enough for me. Two out of three ain't bad. Thank you, Meatloaf, for weighing in on plant-based meat. In the years since I wrote that, there has been research looking at direct human health effects. In particular, a study called Swap Meat by Christopher Gardner at Stanford, which looked at plant-based meat directly versus comparable beef. So this hamburger versus an alternative hamburger and a whole host of biomarkers. And there was clearly a net human health benefit of the plant-based meat. So yes, ultra processed, but you know, frankly, the, the hamburgers that people are eating, they're ultra processed too, in the sense that it's beef on an usually ultra processed bun and sometimes with ultra processed ketchup. And so, you know, I mean, let's, let's make a valid comparison here. The switch to a plant-derived source still winds up being a net benefit. So now it's not just that two out of three ain't bad, but three out of three is really good. So I think there are exceptions to ultra-processing being in the service of bad intentions. I think there are times it can be directly in the service of really good intentions. And we have to very carefully differentiate baby from bathwater. So the AHA and I are completely aligned. On that point of view, I would I just might choose different examples because I think, you know, on for example, the whole whole grain bread, I think you can find whole grain bread that isn't ultra processed. I suppose what they're talking about there is just the inclusion of something like in a, you know, so it's whole grain bread and it's got an emulsifier or you know, some ingredient you wouldn't have in your home kitchen, so it qualifies as ultra processed. And last thing I'll say is I've actually I've had some interesting conversations directly with Pro- Professor Montero, who's a friend, about this issue. And you know, it, it, you think maybe there's some way to refine the definition of ultra processing so it has something to do with why that ingredient is there, what role it's playing. The one other thing that, that's important, and I agree with the HA on this topic as well. We have a general understanding that ultra-processed food and bad food overlap. We don't know yet an awful lot about all the different ingredients that could result in qualifying as ultra-processed, like, for example, you know, any given emulsifier or texturizer, and the specific health effects of that. I think we kind of want to know both. We want to know that, in general, ultra-processing is bad, and in general, there are exceptions to ultra-processing being bad. But we'd also like to know, and by the way, here's the very long list of ingredients that would result in the designation of ultra-processed, and here's what they do to human metabolism and physiology and biomarkers and health. When it comes to gut health, I couldn't find a supplement that did it all. So I formulated one with gastroenterologist, Dr. Will Bolsowitz. It's called Daily Microbiome Nutrition or DMN by 38 Terra. And to our knowledge, it is the most complete prebiotic formula on the market today. We built DMN to support a healthy, diverse microbiome, which we now know plays a critical role in everything from digestion to immunity, metabolism, and even brain health. What sets DMN apart is that it contains clinically proven doses of ingredients like actazin and solanol, and it's a very concentrated source of polyphenols, all conveniently combined to nourish your gut bacteria and promote true microbial diversity. No artificial sweeteners, no gums or fillers, just science-backed 
plant-based ingredients in a once a day, incredibly delicious drink. So if you're looking to fuel your microbes and enjoy all the benefits that come with that, head to 38terra.com and use the code SIMON for 10% off. That's 38tera.com and use the code SIMON to feed those gut bugs. Thank you.